Canada's preeminent filmmakers, maybe perhaps one of the most important filmmakers we have working in our cinema. This is, uh, as a co-hosted event, uh, to celebrate Canadian masters in Canadian cinema, but also 40 years of film studies at Carleton University. The first film courses were offered in the academic year 1976-1977. I have some facts to give you about this program. Facts. Mind you, not alternative facts. <laughs> facts. Uh, the course, the program began uh, with the interest of some professors in the English department, notably uh, Chris Faulkner, Peter Harcourt, Patrick McFadden, who thought that the study of cinema was a worthwhile endeavor at the did I forget somebody? George McKnight. George McKnight, too. I, the last time I gave the speech, I was corrected on the, some historical facts. <laughs> I was offering my own alternative facts about the history of this program. George McKnight was also a founding member. The idea was that the cinema was a medium worth studying in a scholarly way at a university like Carleton. By 1976, the university seemed to agree, and a film studies program was established, and it's been going strongly ever since. Uh, and we, as I said, we're celebrating our, our 40th anniversary. Uh, many of my colleagues are here tonight. Professor Aubrey Annabel, Professor Laura Horak, Gunnar Iverson, Andre Loisel is here as well. There he is. Um, and Susanna Pick, who was there from almost the beginning. What year did you arrive, Susanna? 76. 76 that she was there from the beginning. Throughout the history of this program, the Canadian cinema has been a central part of the curriculum, a central part of the, the mission of this program. And Susanna herself, in fact, has written on the cinema of Obamsuin, uh, has been a champion of, of her films for a very long time. So, as I said, we've been, we're very pleased to be co-hosting the event tonight. I'm going to leave it to Tom now to introduce our special guest tonight, and I hope you enjoy the evening with our, our guest. Thank you very much. Uh, just a reminder that uh, tomorrow night uh, we are having a screening of uh, Alan Sabomson's latest film, We Can't Make the Same Mistake Twice. It's a free screening at Carleton University's uh, Ridgecraft Hall, formerly the River Building Theatre, starting at 7 o'clock tomorrow evening. So 
please uh, come in and see this extraordinary film. Um, you'll see a little bit of it in the clip reel we're going to show you now, um, just to, as a reminder. Such is the uh, enormous achievement of our Canadian master guest tonight, Alanis Abomsawin, that if we had if we'd even started this series 20 years ago, she would still have been designated a Canadian master. Since 1971, Alanis Abomsawin has written and directed more than 25 films, produced many, many others, and has been involved in developing young talents as a mentor and a teacher. She has also been, and still is, a singer-songwriter, storyteller, and performer. Through her films, she has also redrawn the map of Canadian cinema and arguably, perhaps, Canada's map itself. As an officer, she's an officer of the Order of Canada, a Governor General's Award winner in visual and media arts, as well as in performing arts, Governor General's uh, Award winner. She has received international critical acclaim, innumerable film festival awards, and holds honorary doctorates from several universities, including Carleton University. Most recently, in November 2016, she received two of Quebec's highest honors, the Prix Albert Tessier for contributions to cinema, and was named a Grand Officer of the National Order of Quebec. Also in November of this past year, she received the Clyde Gilmore Award from the Toronto Film Critics Association, which identified her correctly as, quote, a significant architect of Canadian cinema and culture. So before we welcome this extraordinary artist to the stage for conversation, uh, we have prepared a sample reel of some of uh, the work she has made in the last 25 years. So there's too much work to do a sample reel of everything. Um, so we invite you now to sample the extraordinary work of Alanis Abrosson. And then you can Carmel Scott. He's uh, standing in front of the, uh, the government of the day uh, and speaking on the creation of a bill to implement the uh, Indian residential school system in Canada, 1920. And he said, I want to get rid of the Indian problem. I do not think, as a matter of fact, that the country ought to continuously protect a class of people who are able to stand alone. Our objective is to continue until there is not a single Indian in Canada that has not been absorbed into the body politic, and there is no Indian question and no Indian department. That is the whole objective of this bill. And he's the same guy who sat down with my grandfather to talk about, uh, talk about the treaty. And the sad part is, 2013, is there Duncan Campbell Scots who think that way in Toronto, Kingston, Ottawa, Montreal, Ottawa? You're darn right there is. There's people, unfortunately, that still have that mindset. And that's why we got to continue talking about the treaty. That's why we got to continue talking about the the good things that came out of it and the, our understandings from our elders in regard to the tree. That's amazing, it just yeah. brings you to tears, eh? Yeah. They know very well what they are fighting for. And it's probably worth much than uh, just nine holes in the ground. A peace camp is established in Oka. On this first weekend, more than 2,500 people come from across the continent to show their support for the Mohawk Nation. For over 100 years, they have tried to look after us, but they have failed miserably. It is us who can determine what is best for us. We will determine our own future. The greatest threat to unity and democracy in this country is not the Aboriginal people, nor the Quebec, but rather the lack of leadership of the government of Canada. We should wake up and learn 
that history can teach you many things, but you've got to listen. This is an opportunity for Canada to express whether it can live up to its almighty mandate for human rights that is so well, it's so well known for throughout the world. Why is it that we live in a country where the police never come to the aid of the Aboriginal people? And yet we see them across this country being utilized by provincial governments to suppress the rights of the Aboriginal people of this country. Somebody had asked me, how far are you willing to go? Is it six feet under? And I think that's what's going to happen. You're not going to see, you're going to see a death feast. You're not going to see land claims. And uh, they're proving it. But that's what they want, huh? Shut up the Indian, keep the Indian nation down where they had them for so many years. I go to jail. I'm going to walk through those doors in honor. I'm not going in as a junkie. Nothing to be ashamed of. Yeah. And when I come out, I'll teach my children and my grandchildren to fight. No more compassion. I've had it. I was raised as a pacifist. I was raised that if you don't want to be, have prejudice on you, don't put it out. And we went through a lot. But this has changed me. I've never been violent. I've never thought to hit out, to strike out. But now don't look at me sideways because I know I'll never bow down to them because you just they just step on your hands. If this is civilized, I'd rather stay on this side of the barricade. The police had orders not to arrest anyone. Their concerns were to prevent the crowd from reaching the cars and blocking their passage over the bridge. We're sitting in the car waiting, waiting. My great-grandmother was about 92, and my grandmother, I'm not sure of her age at the time. And uh, I was 18. There was hundreds of people on the other side now calling us down, yelling at us, calling us savages, and saying stuff in English and French. Just sit. It wasn't nice. At the time, there was myself, my daughter, Sarah. She was 18 months, her father, and our babysitter. And we saw all the people on the other side waiting. And we also heard rumors of conversation on the French radio station to entice people to come over. and to harass us in many different ways. I got out of my car and I went and talked to a peacekeeper. I said, I can't go out. I was like drained, drained. It was hot and uh, I had no more energy. So uh, then he said, get in your car there, go. And Finally, after the crowd really built up to say two or 3,000 people out there, all of a sudden the SQ says it's okay to go. You just can leave. Then I started to get nervous, but there was no way to turn back at this point. The delay was incredible. We were on top of the bridge at a, quite a height, 90 degree weather. They assured us after two checks of the, every car that everything was okay. Keep your windows up and just keep going and don't stop for anything. Don't stop for anything. And I said to him, my God, there's people. You no, know, they were, you could see them on the banks. Said, what if somebody fell and run them over and just keep on going, don't stop for nothing. It was all lined with police all the way up, and they were like screaming at you, go faster, go faster, and they kept waving you through and just waving. I saw a policeman standing in front of, of somebody with, with a pile of rocks and just step aside when, when I went through and just let them throw them. Everybody started following, and stones, sticks, 
bricks, boulders, thrown from all angles. Your right, your left, from a walkway on top. You're just throwing and throwing. A couple of rocks hit the car. I started uh, getting nervous. My grandmother was really nervous and she was driving. It was bad. And you could see the people waiting with piles of rocks. Well, they had all their ammunition ready and all, oh, there was so many people. There was hundreds of people, just a big crowd. It's very probable that it was from the police provincial. It was the same as it was on the top of the rock. These people started to pick up rocks and they started throwing them. And uh, one of the policemen was you know, trying to stop them. He was like one, and all the rest of the police were way up on the, on, on the ridge part, on the abutment part. So as we went through, one big rock hit my, uh, my son's car on the back and a couple of smaller ones uh, and broke like the back window and it left a big dent in there. I could look in the rear view mirror and all I could see is the dust as we were, you know, as we were going through. The SQs, they were just standing there, they were watching. They had their backs to the people and just watching windshields being smashed, uh, you name it. There was a phone call that came into uh, the council office and said there were problems on the bridge. We didn't know the extent of those problems uh, so we rushed and turned the TV on. It was just awful because you were so powerless. There was nothing you could do. Our ceremonies are relevant to us as they were prior to Columbus. How we live our life, our worldview, uh, our land, uh, the waters, the fish, everything is connected to each other in, in more deeper ways than um, how we've come to be organized by North American social policies and you know, legislation and so forth. I attended university and I did my thesis on Aboriginal self-determination, on how about we have to take the initiative if we want to control our destinies and create a destiny that's going to be beneficial for our people, we have to be willing to stand up and go out and take that political initiative and make it happen, even if it means that we have to be at odds with the Canadian government. It's a, it, for a lot of people, they may see that as detrimental. They may say, oh my God, why? Well, look at the consequences involved. But I always ask, you know, look at the consequences of inaction. If our condition right now, what we consider peace with the Canadian nation, produces the highest suicide rates in the world, some of the highest incarceration rates in the country, alcohol, drug, spouse, child abuse, way beyond anything comparable to the non-native society, why are we trying so hard to maintain this condition? So if I stand and make a fight for my people, I'm following the traditions of a warrior, looking out for the next seven generations. We will not allow unauthorized fishing, and we will take enforcement action. I remember one morning when there was a whole fleet coming towards us. 
and we jumped on our dories and these are just small little dories about 16 foot to 12 foot dories and uh, we all looked at each other and uh, we all kind of just shouted at each other not to, uh, to uh, stand your ground you know we're fishing here and we're not doing anything wrong I said well, that's all we're doing but they came and came and there were so many of them Every time they came, there was a little more aggression. And every time that we went out, we were, we were really unsure about any one of us coming back to shore. So it really got a little um, scary for a lot of us. But for some, I've seen uh, the looks in their eyes. You know, I've seen the proudness in their eyes, and and uh, I know that they were committed. They made a commitment to stay in the waters, regardless of their own safety. And that uh, that put a lot of pride back in our in our hearts. Are people willing to make a change? Are they willing to open up their eyes and see, or do they just not care? Or has it been 500 years of oppression that's got us to this point where we're psychologically incapable of making change? I don't know. We can't do it. I mean, it, it's not like it was five years. This just happened in the past five years. This is, takes years and years and years and generation after generation. This land was taken away from us illegally, and that's a fact. No one can deny that. No one can deny that we were the first people in this continent. Therefore, if it was taken illegally, whether it was yesterday or 300 years ago, it has to be returned to us. We're not here to uh, chase anybody out. We have to live together. Whether it's the English, the French, or the Mi'kmaq, you no, know, we know we're all here to stay. Even when they began to uh, settle on our shores and, and when they began squatting, we still held out our hand and said, we will, we will share with you. That's the message that's got to be given to the people. Do not be afraid for this recognition of our ancestral territory. I know it's going to happen. It's coming. It's going to come sooner than what people think. encouraging a lot of peer teaching right now. And one student, again, he's having a hard time in and out of school. Finally got him to go out and uh, like share his knowledge about teaching. Um, he said he was gonna teach the kids how to rabbit snare. So it was Friday, really cold day. Okay, not too many kids showed up, but we bundled up. We went out on his sled and we went out and we had a fire. And the kids really had a really 
they had a rest. They had a little bit of a break from things. And they talked about how, how hard things are sometimes and just that kind of quiet time, you know, when you're having a fire and people talk. That's that time when you start seeing that they really care about each other. Like I saw that youth later in the weekend and he had pride. Like he's like, I, I went out and I taught the kids something and he said the whole school should be here. So to keep encouraging that, so if they hear negative things or feel that, just to have more strength and um, to have pride in their culture and to not let anybody put them down and that we'll get through this. I think that we will. This case is about access to justice for some of the most vulnerable members of society, Aboriginal children living on reserve. We had so many people wanting to come here and participate and learn from this that we had to put them in in shifts. We've had children here as young as six who have sat attentively, respectfully, who have listened, who have learned, and who have formed their own opinions. And what gives me such great hope is when they grow up and they have families of their own, they will have a different place of information to make decisions about how, what they're going to tell their children about First Nations peoples and the country of Canada and our responsibility to care for one another. It feels good because I know there's something wrong in the world and I want to fix it. And the kids are going to win because you're here supporting them. So thank you to all of you for what you're doing. Okay? Very excited to meet all of you. Thank you. Well done. Ladies and gentlemen, Alanis Abomsawin. astonishingly intense moments that appear in the films that you make. Before you arrived at the NFB, you had another life where you were not a filmmaker, astonishing that seems to me. Now, uh, could you tell us a little bit of your journey to the National Film Board in Montreal? You were a singer, you were a performer, you were an educator. Speak a little bit about what led you to the doors of the NFB in the 60s. Well, first, before I was making films, I was singing. And my reason for this was I um, was very much they called me an activist at that time. Mm -hmm. And I was fighting against the educational system that was teaching in a very organized way to books written by Les Frères des Écoles And, you know, when you're a little you don't realize what's going on. But as I got older, by the time I was 15, 16, I knew that uh, something was really bad. And to realize that this way of teaching was designed 
for one reason, to make sure that the people of this country that went to school and learned about history would for sure hate us. It was really designed to create hate towards our people. And they did very well for a very long time, they succeeded. But somehow I knew that uh, I just wonder what could I do when I, you know, I'm getting beat up all the time and you want to have a better place for the children after you, this kind of stuff. So I thought, I have to go into the classroom and tell them a different story. And that's how I started. I started with the scouts at first. Oh, yeah. yeah. I went with a group of scouts in the bush, traveled with them and told them stories and sang for them. I really loved it. I enjoyed it. And then I started going to classroom. And at first, the teachers were looking at me with real big eyes <laughs> when I would come in with my drum, probably thinking, what is she going to tell the children? <laughs> but I never went in there and say, hey, you liars. You know, what mm -hmm. you're doing is very bad. I never said that, although I knew it was. Yeah. And, uh, but I came with a different story. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I sang to the children and told them my history of, of my own people and other nations in the country. And at the recreation time, I would run with the kids outside and teach them Indian games. And I really enjoyed it because I, I love children. And after a while, I could not do enough. You know, people would say, oh, come to our school and stay here a month and we do every classroom. And Stuff like that. Not of you. One time I did every school in Ottawa and every school in Gatineau. Wow. wow. Can you come back and do that again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, next, next week. Yeah, next week. Okay. <laughs> so it was from there, and in 1960, we became Canadian citizens. I bet you didn't know this big news, did you? For the first time. Mm -hmm, right. And uh, so we start to organize. You know, all of us. Uh, in different parts of the country, never had much travel before. Mm -hmm. So we start to organize and meeting each other, and ah, we felt so rich because we would go, imagine me going to the prairies. I've never been in a place where there were no trees. Oh, la la. <laughs> <laughs> so I, it was just so unbelievable, and I met many nations, people from many different nations, mm -hmm. and it was like, we just felt so so rich, we all felt related. Mm -hmm. So much love, it was just uh, unbelievable. And then uh, I come from a, a community reserve called Odenac in the province of Quebec. It's halfway between Montreal and Quebec on the south shore by the San Francis River. And our river was very, still is very highly polluted. And our children were not welcome uh, in the next village uh, mm. to go swimming in their swimming pool. They say no sanitia. <laughs> and one time I was playing with the children and you know, they were crying and I said, ah, don't worry, we'll get our own swimming pool. So you, know, you say this to children, the next day they say, where is the pool? <laughs> <laughs> so I went to uh, the band office and I asked permission to do a campaign, uh, which I did. I thought it would be easy, because I was singing a lot, and I was quite well known, especially You're on TV for that, that. on CBC for that yeah. campaign. So, uh, but it didn't turn out like that. It was so hard, it was so humiliating. <laughs> I went through hell from A to Z. But I had in mind to do it, and it took me four years, and I finally was able to build a swimming pool on credit, because I never okay. had money. Yeah. And, but I managed to pay everything late. Okay, pay everything. That's how it's done. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. And um, and CBC, uh, Ron Kelly made a film about what I was doing at the time, this campaign to build the pool. To, yeah. And it was from there, it appeared on CBC Prime Time. Uh, the program was called Telescope. Mm -hmm. And uh, then from there, the film board they invited me to go there. They invited me to this small theater at the time. And they sat me like this in front of a group of people, mostly directors and producers. 
And uh, they said, well, tell us stories like you do in the classroom. So that was easy, I didn't have any <laughs> problem, which I did. And it was from there, because my interest was so much uh, in education, mm -hmm. there was a studio at the film board at the time, it was called Multimedia. And in that studio, everything they did was for the classroom. Uh -huh. And it was done through film strips. You probably all too young to get a film strip done. It's, um, you do your story, you, you get your story together, and you're working with photographs or slides. Mm -hmm. And you know, we had a light table, so you number your slides, and you maybe the story is 10 minutes or so, and you have a uh, 100 slides, let's say they're all numbered. And you do your exercise by listening to the sound and write, uh, you know, by, this, by then I was uh, interviewing people, make them, make old people tell their history. Mm -hmm. And my narration. So you know, you get all this together on a, on a light table. It's just slides. Even if you had fo old photographs, you get them uh, under animation camera. You get them shot as a, as a slide, so that it, it was easier to work. And then once you were ready, and you had your sound ready, and you had uh, your images. You went to the animation camera, and they shot everything, and it became one band, 35 mil, one, I um, don't even know how to call this, uh, just one strip, one strip of, yeah. of, of 35 mil. So you had your whole story there. So back in the classroom, they, in, in those days, they all had this small projector. <coughs> and this projector, you put in your, your film strip. Your yeah. film strip here in the projector, and over here you had a record player. <laughs> and you had a long playing record playing that for the sound for the image. And the teacher would take a, a student who would sit next to the little projector and you'd hear her say, there were 12 chips here, and the girl would move the frame by hand <laughs> to change the image, following the sound. By the time I finished the first educational kit, it was a little bit more advanced. So then, by the time I got there, you had the same long playing record playing the sound, and you had the same projector here, but here it would say, there were 12 chiefs here, boing! <laughs> <laughs> and the boing would make the frame change. <laughs> and for me, I was worried, I thought, man, I'm going to go back to the community with this, this, uh, and this is the, the range, you know, this, <laughs> this boing after each phrase. <laughs> and uh, so I was a little bit embarrassed about that. <laughs> but then we were so excited because it was the first time we had a professional product in the classroom made by us, and it was the voice yeah. of our people. In this case, it was the Atigamek people from Manwan. This old man was telling the history. Then I, uh, we did the seven little film strips. The, the history was 20 minutes each, twice, at 40 minutes of history. And many short little film strips with the sun. And one of them was moose calling. <laughs> Another one was canoe making, birch bark canoe. Another one was snowshoes. And all the things that was important to them in their everyday life, plus the history. And in the same box, I had uh, made some people work, and we had toys in the box. Like we had a puppet, we had uh, a, a puzzle that this old man came. It was so hard to put together. You could pick it all apart, but once it was apart, you had to be very smart to be able to get it back the way it should be. And uh, it was really very exciting. Mm -hmm. And Jenny was so happy with yeah, this. Okay, right. That's the, that's the, they called them educational yeah. kids. So I did one in Manman, took us forever, because I was working in three language, and I was also learning all the technology <coughs> and how to do this. And uh, a bit later, I started working on the, I started in 1967. At the board. Yes, yeah. on contract. But um, I, he wouldn't give me money fin to finish the film. It took so long, it never came out until 1971. Oh, wow. 
but I was working all the time on the educational kit during that time. I see. And uh, this film was, you know, I just needed to, didn't need that much money, but anyway, they were making it difficult. This is Christmas at Moose Time, yes. your first film. Yeah. Wow. A 13 minute, and you use the drawings of children and their yes. voices. Yes. Uh, uh, I was doing the sound. Yeah. The first time I'm, I'm, I'm a sound person, and I'm doing that. I have a, a, a young man who's doing photographs. And uh, I was so fascinated by the wind. And the residential <laughs> school, the, the building itself where the children uh, slept was an old, old rundown building. And once you are inside the, this building, the, you know, the door don't close right. So mm -hmm. there's a little bit of wind under it. Right. Then you hear this wind. It was so incredible. So I, I rushed by the door and take that wind. <laughs> and then I, I take the wind in so many places from a window because it didn't close properly, the door, uh, outside because uh, you hear people walking from real far places. Far. And you, because it's nothing. And you hear the step for step, and I start taping. And the person might have been uh, 10 minutes away, I was starting to tape <laughs> before they passed in front of me. And by the time I got back to the film board, they were fascinated because they were using kind of the always the same wind. And <laughs> 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 so I was very popular. You did research in the film. Yeah, yes, yeah, so they could use my wind. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. I love the children. I so much fun with them. And at that time, everybody there spoke the language. Uh -huh. So the children, their second language was English. So they had this really beautiful, thick accent that I just love. And it's Christmas time. So there was a teacher, she wanted to make a Shakespearean Christmas play. And I never laughed so much in my life. <laughs> <laughs> the children, the girl who's the Virgin Mary, she had a pair of jeans on, and she had a, like a big towel around here. <laughs> and she had a doll. And uh, then the, the children who were playing the, the les rois, you know, the kings, mm -hmm. they had like a, a, a thing to, to dry the, shop, the dishes with. You know, oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, they were, uh, and they all look, and you know, they were so uh, Indian looking. They all looked like they, they were part of the, the Jesus Christ thing. <laughs> and the teacher, I never understood why she said to the children, "Say star," and the children say, "Star, <laughs> star, <laughs> star, <laughs> stable, stable." <laughs> She just couldn't let, because everywhere there was a nest, the Cree of the James Bay area <laughs> at that time, and they still do in many cases, put an H instead. And when you go to the prairies, Crees are everywhere in the country. And the Crees and the Western Cree, they put an S. So they, you know, they'll say, um, Sue's. Instead oh, of shoes. So shoes so they put a nest, but it's the same word yeah. with a different uh, accent bec of because of the pronunciation of, of these letters. So many, oh, I was, I thought I'm learning so much. Oh, I'm in a great school. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my beginning at the film board. Wow. And uh, I learned a lot and, and I got a lot of support and mm -hmm. a lot of problems too and a lot of fights too and all sure. those and it's part of the same pot. And, um, and I am working on my 50th film. Oh. Wow. wow. <laughs> well, we can make 50 years. Thank you. So when you're there in the 70s when you started in 76, sorry, late 60s. What was it like at the NFB in those times, just in a general way? There was the there was Studio D that was coming along, there was a... Not, not right away. Not right away, so but yeah. you know, and the, the women's movement generally, and you were making, you made Christmas Moose Factory, and then you made uh, Mothers of Many Children, and on this in the 70s. And, that and into the 80s. Yeah, that, that was... 81, uh, yeah. uh, yeah. So how did you... I suppose it doesn't, um, how the, the subjects of your documentaries uh, arrive to you, it's not a surprise, but I'm interested to know within the National Film Board, how you were a problem. 
even when I was born, I was a problem because I never ate meat or fish in my life. In your life? So my father was a guy, and my parents mainly they eat fish uh -huh. and, and meat. So I used to hear the old people in my village, and our language, oh, she's going to die younger. They should say, <laughs> now I'm 84 years old. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lesson or two yeah. there for sure. So when you're when you're moving out of let's say the educational, strictly speaking, educational work that you do with film strips and into the Christmas of these factory context, where you make a film about that, and into one might say a more political arena, in particular with the incident at Restigouche, which is an extraordinary 46 minutes of that um, particular event. Uh, are you yourself becoming, you sound like you've been political your whole life and active, but when your filmmaking starts to reflect that and you become more engaged, was that when it started or was it that, is it all part of the same sort of process? In your I mind? think it's the same. Yeah. yeah. It's education at some level, I guess. Education, I, I knew education was the most important thing because we were in so much trouble and there was so much pain and so much injustice mm -hmm. and fights and beatings and raping and you know yeah. you, you were not we, I was living a dangerous life just by being around mm -hmm. and um, uh, I forgot what I want to say no you're, you're on the right track okay. um, and I think of films in the 80s particularly like Richard Cardinal the diary of the crime the diary of the amazing child which was a deeply personal story and very emotionally told, but it had an actual impact on policy making in Alberta at the time uh, for foster, the foster child placement legislation was affected by your film. And films about, as you say, all of the struggle, and yet there was also the filmmakers Lodge, a place of healing. These extraordinary people that you were filming who are under such duress and yet have this incredible hope against all of the kinds of odds that you chronicle in your work. That was, it's really pronounced to me, particularly in those <coughs> mid-80s movies that you made. Those must have been very difficult to make, were they? For yeah. You? yeah. I don't know if I've ever made an easy thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. But uh, every, I, I knew in advance. You know, if you want to be a filmmaker, if you want to be a documentary filmmaker, and uh, if you want to be a good one and an honest one and cover and tell it like it is, you have to be prepared. People, some are going to love you and some are going to hate you and want to get back at you. And it's very, very difficult politically and how you face people mm -hmm. uh, doing this kind of work. Mm -hmm. So you have to make sure this is what you want to do and no matter what you're going to do it because you believe in it because you want to see something good for your people, because you want to see justice, because you want changes. All those things don't come and say, oh, hello, today I buy you. That's not like that. And people uh, dislike you and say bad things about you and you're often humiliated. And but the big prize is when you see changes and it's when you see people Stop being afraid and uh, to take away the fear and the injustice and it's slow and it every little mark counts. You know, it's like when you have a, a child that is, is in special need and you watch every move and every smile and uh, parents are the ones who can really do that. Everything, every word, every way you look at somebody or somebody looks at you makes a difference that day. You can make somebody feel terrible and excluded and not wanted just by looking at them a certain way. And I'm sure you all know what that look, looks like. And so it all has to do for me uh, with love and inclusion and making people feel good about themselves and they're never told enough how beautiful they are. We're all beautiful. And uh, I, I think it's very important because the bottom line, it's love that makes all the change. So when you're surrounded by hate, all around yourself, your body, your house, your street, you have to be careful not to go out certain hours. 
it's very difficult to live like that. And uh, if you are making, whether it's a book or you're doing a painting, and you can send some beautiful feeling to a human being, even this person you don't know, I think that it is worth it for all. And for me, that's how I think. And in the most difficult time, I try to go in my heart or the neighbor's heart to find, I look for the good part because in the most nasty place, there's a good part there. And you have to try and bring it up. That's how I do. Amen to that. Absolutely. And you yourself have been implicated in your films. You're in your films, your voiceover, but also you in some of the most incendiary situations, for example, in Kansataki, two and seven years of resistance, but also uh, the film in the Mary uh, is the crown at war with us and our nationhood, et cetera, et cetera. Your presence in those environments as a, as a filmmaker, um, how does that, in what you're saying, because you're, you're a great observer of what's happening, but without being detached in that way. And I know that's gotten you into some debates about documentary and the nature of documentary cinema. Uh, some people don't, don't understand what you're doing. Um, but you've always been engaged in a direct way uh, on screen. Um, and does that come again? That the, you know? came at the beginning. The film board was pushing me that way in a sense because as you were saying at that time, when somebody's looking at a film and you hear a voice, then, uh, then perhaps you're interviewing somebody, but you never see the interviewer mm -hmm. that is at its bothersome right. for the person who's watching. I mean, who's that uh, talking? Like you want to, you go like this, you try to, and that's how it all started. Uh -huh. right. And I was always very involved in every story. You know, they say, oh, one time I went to a, a university and they, they were teaching journalism and, uh, and the teacher asked me, what would you do if, you, if you're uh, filming and there's a child dying here? Are you going to continue filming, or are you going to try and help the child? I said, I'm going to help the child. He <laughs> says, you're a bad journalist. <laughs> <laughs> I said, wow. so I'm a bad journalist. Yeah, yeah. wow. <laughs> yeah. You said once that documentary, a real documentary, is about really listening yes. to someone else. That's the thing. Yes, uh, and I, I still work the same way as I did when I first began. I first will come to a community or to a, a person that I might be interviewing or working with. I go along first with the tape recorder. Of course, I make sure that I have a broadcast quality uh, mm -hmm. recorder. Because the first sound, and believe you me, I, it never fails. The first sound that you hear from a person who is recounting a story or their life experience, and you're alone with this person, there's something that develops here, a kind of a trust, and I, I never get tired of listening. I find human beings so interesting. It's so fascinating to hear someone tell you about their life and how they've survived and what they've done. I, Everyone has an interesting story. And um, so the, the first meeting is very important. So at first, I don't have a crew with me. I just go alone. And I collect the sound. I might go several times before I decide to bring a crew. And uh, then I get this transcribed, and I read it, and reread it, and until I feel the I really hear and understand the story. And uh, then I will come with the food. But then by the time you get into the cutting room and you have all your sync sound and you're doing your story, you're not going to go and tell the person, uh, maybe perhaps somebody cries or they have a very moving moment when they are saying something. You're not going to go to that person and see you do that again. <laughs> So the, the beauty of it is while you interview someone on camera, the audience sees who this person is, and of course you're talking about, about the same subject, and then I can go to my first track, to the first sound that I taped, and I use it over images 
of what this person is talking about. And I have that in almost every film I've made. And uh, I find for me it's very precious. And now you, I mean, that's a really interesting process because the mountains of footage that you collect, for example, for Ghana Sapatu, 270 years of resistance, that's 119 minutes, but you had 200 plus hours of material or more. Uh, and you made four films out of it. Exactly. So when you sit in, the, in that vast mountain range of sound and image, what, how do you structure your, yeah. it, it's a very interesting process, I don't know how you do it. <laughs> well, for <laughs> me, I'm a storyteller. Yeah, right. And uh, I find a way to, with the contribution of several people, Mm -hmm. to put the story together. That's always the way I work. Right. I think also it might come from, I was raised on the reserve, mm -hmm. and we didn't have any electricity in those days, uh, or running water. We had a well, we had an earth road, and uh, we had oil lamp. So at night, what would you think was happening? The adults would tell us stories. So if right. you had, five children listening to one story, you have one voice, one person is telling a story, you have five children listening, so the imagination of each child is different. Mm -hmm. So each child is seeing images for this story that is very different than the one next to him right. or to her. Mm -hmm. So it means that you have, from the same sound you have, five different stories. Right there. I think it's that's where it comes from that I for me the voice the word is more important uh -huh. than the image. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Do and you I, make, I do continue you working. At, eh? Sorry, do you do you make radio documentaries too, or do you always? I've like never that? done the radio as such as a part of my work. I've had right. a lot of stuff on the radio, but not didn't start to do a program for radio. Right. But I love radio. Yeah, the, the oral tradition, but also you're a musician. So you're attuned to sound in a way also. Uh, I don't know if I can call myself a musician. I don't play <laughs> any instruments except my drum. Well, <laughs> it's the old joke about who hangs out I with sing. musicians and drummer. You sing, of course. I sing. In fact, when people came in tonight, that was Alan Lisa's voice you were listening to singing. Mm -hmm. um, we found yes. like, CBC archives. <laughs> Home. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, if you the interview that on Telescope that you talked about earlier, that is also on the CBC archives, digital archives. So, if you're interested to have a look at it, and I should also mention the National Film Board of Canada website. Many of your films are online and free to to watch. And it's an extraordinary resource to, to see your work that people have not seen. It. So, tell us about your recent into the 20, 21st century of this extraordinary, really a kind of mosaic of struggle back to When the did what year the 21st century stuff? I think it was, I'm not sure. What did it start for you? I'm always lost in time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think since um, the bunch of last films that I made uh, started 2010, Yeah. In the James Bay, right. and uh, they're all interconnected. Right. There's five films. This and five. I'm finishing uh, the fifth one now, right. and uh, the film board's going to make a coffee with it, which is going to be interesting, especially for teaching. That's yeah, yeah. that's great. Right. Yeah. And the one, the last two, we started the the fifth year with the, the trailer for Trick or Treat, which you made in 2014. Uh, and your most recent film, which we're showing tomorrow night, we can't make the same mistake uh, twice. What I found interesting about them, I was telling you earlier today, was that they are dealing with the same condition or challenge or problem, and you've moved it into the, in, in your focus to the legal system, particularly with we can't make the same mistake, how the processes of law work in Canada, and the treaty, trick or treaty one, mm -hmm. about how treaties are understood. They're written, but how are they understood by either side? 
which is a really interesting level to go from uh, into your into this examination of this. Well, in general, people have no clue on what a three T is, first of all. Right. And often, you know, like in the past, it's starting to change now. You call about a three T and say, oh, "What are you talking about? Three T's gone, it's finished. It doesn't exist." Right. Well, right. it's not true at all. Mm -hmm. People's lives are, are still uh, um, connected to the three T in, in their everyday life. Mm -hmm. And uh, treaty number nine, uh, which is the treaty that is in question in the uh, Trickle Treaty, is wonderful for teaching. Mm -hmm. And people, uh, when they realize how dishonest and how full of lies it is, mm -hmm. how they've written uh, this treaty in a certain way, and but they never told the people what really was in the treaty. They told them something they'd like to hear so that they would uh -huh. sign. So they'd sign it, right. And then, uh, you know, it's, it's stealing with the license. Mm -hmm. There's no other word. Yeah. 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 So these things now are really coming on the surface. And, and you know, for some nations, the, look at the Chilcotin. Two years ago, they won finally. But they had been fighting for 30 years mm -hmm. to get titles to their land. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of areas, uh, the, what the government has been doing, they're trying to renegotiate old treaties that, that were made. But eventually, the areas where there's no treaty, eventually there has to be a treaty. People, they laugh when you say this, but uh, yeah. you know, you don't want to laugh weird, because uh, eventually justice has to be made. Mm -hmm. What do you think of 150 years? <laughs> yeah. 150 years. To be fair, you know, I have seen a lot of changes mm -hmm. for the better for our people, especially since 1970. After the first time when 1960 came and they uh, said that our people were now Canadian citizens. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time that the government told our people, you can now write to the government and identify your territory. Right. That's only in 1960. Yeah. And so, of course, I don't know if all the nations did this, but I would say most of them to identify what their land was and where it was. And uh, so it, 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 over the years, there's been a lot of treaties that were renegotiated. Mm -hmm. Some are, have been a success and some not. And, uh, but more and more our people are getting to be quite well educated. Mm -hmm. In 1960, we used to have a communication system that we call Moccasin Telegraph. <laughs> and that was telephoning each other. Telephoning each other. I remember one time someone phoned me from, <coughs> I think, from Saskatchewan somewhere, and he said, Ah, oh, yes, did you know this man is named um, Lavalli? I remember the name. The name is a, is, is a medical doctor. And you know, in those days, before 1951, we were not allowed to go to university unless you became a Canadian citizen. And to become a Canadian citizen at that time, it meant if you said, okay, I'm going to come uh, become a, so you were, you had to give up your rights as an Indian person, mm -hmm. could no longer live on the reserve. If you had property, you had to part with it, you had to sell it or, or give it to relatives or something. And then uh, back at, at the village, people called you traitor because you sold out. And s in some cases, they call it enfranchise. And the government would give them a bit of money. I knew a family had uh, six thousand dollars. Oh, it's a lot of money. And they left the reserve, and they end up on skid row, and it's a horrible life. So going back to the village, they were not welcome. People would say, mm -hmm. "You sold out. You know, you, you're a traitor." And it was very, very difficult. A very difficult time. And. Um, but if you were um, 
so intelligent and you went to school and then you would be allowed to go to university because you were living in a city and you were no longer a savage, in other words. So, um, but not before that. 1952, I think, was the first time. And uh, then by 1960, now we are Canadian citizens, so people could uh, go to university without having to deny their race. You know, all those things take, took many years of people's life and uh, a lot of trauma. And, and then, you know, we had the residential school, uh, the first one, I think, in 1849. And um, all that has created, uh, I'm sure, you hear about it every day. So it's taken us a long time to, to just understand how all this happened and why. And it's, it's not easy. No. We start thinking it's normal to get beat up, it's normal to get insulted. It's normal, people tell you, oh, your parents are just drunk, and you're no good, your language is a devil's language, not allowed to speak your language. So, you know, you look in the mirror at one point, you start believing it. And for a long time, they told us, this is not your name, this is not your language, this is your language, this is your name, this is what you're doing, this is how you think, and this is how you pray, and on and on. So then we start believing this is what we are. And we're not. So the sickness is very high. Mm -hmm. and how, how, I mean, have your films helped you work this through yeah. yourself as well? Like the, from the very first one up to the one you're going to make that you're making? Every yeah. film I made uh, has made a because it's extraordinary to me the the connection you make always uh, in time. The time is long, and these things that happen, whether it's Restovich or Kanasataki or Kanawagi, these things are located in a long history. They're not little flare-ups that are irritating and inconvenient. They actually belong to a long pattern. And your films are always reminding us of time and history and relationship in this place is a long one mm -hmm. and it's a troubled one. Um, I've always wondered if for you as the filmmaker making, seeing all of this extraordinary stuff and filming it and then editing it and creating the films that you create, has it helped? And, you know, I think you've answered that. But it's, it is something that I think that is... If I didn't think it didn't yeah. help, and it doesn't create change, mm -hmm. and it doesn't make a better life, man, I'd be lying down resting. <laughs> <laughs> you're more fun when you're sitting up talking. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what I feel, I still don't know how to express myself. I have not developed the right language to tell you, because it's much higher than hope, what I feel. We still have a lot of problems, we still have a lot of suicide, we still have a lot of, but we still have a lot of changes and our people getting up and young people doing things. You know, when I was telling you about a doctor uh, that you didn't even know that was the main conversation in those days in the 60s. Now we have lots of doctors and lawyers and mm -hmm. photographers, filmmakers, any discipline I travel across the country I find an immunity in charge someday. It's incredible. That is where we are now. And at this moment, we have, I don't know, perhaps uh, around 400,000 students at their university level. You know, it's a very mm -hmm. different time. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to recognize this. And uh, it's not just bad. There's a lot of good things, sure. and there's a lot of uh, uh, changes. And well, anything is possible. I'm not saying it's easy, but anything mm -hmm. is possible. If you really want to, if you're prepared to work, you can do it. Anybody. I don't think I can talk to that. <laughs> 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 All that is about it.